to a brand new episode of the UK Thrashers radio show. This week, while most of you are at Bloodstock, we've got Orange Goblin in the studio. But before that, let's start off with some music. Here's a brand new single from Elimination from their upcoming album, Echoes of the Abyss. This is Victims by Design. From the USA, this is Invader. This is their first single from their upcoming six track EP. This is Death Trap for an Execution.
was in Veta looking forward to hearing their EP coming over the next couple of months. Okay, next up is our interview for the week. Okay, this week in the virtual studio, we are joined by Man Mountain, Ben Ward from Orange Goblin. Uh, welcome to the studio, mate. Oh, thank you very much. Cheers, Neil. Nice to, uh, to be here. Um, so, uh, sorry about the Man Mountain tag, but uh, Hutch, our reviewer, pointed I, I out that... <laughs> He pointed out that every time he sees a review on kind of any of the magazines, there's always this kind of uh, there's this tag about your size. Are you uh, are you, are you quite happy with this uh, this man mountain yeah, analogy? I mean, still part of being six foot six and eighteen stone, so uh, <laughs> no, I've, I've no I've no complaints with it. I, I am pretty much a man mountain, especially compared to the rest of their band I play with. So. Uh, is, yeah. is that the way? So, surround yourself by small people. I think, I think that cool. helps me look a bit bigger on stage. Is the fact that Joe's five foot six and Harry's five foot six. So, so yeah, <laughs> sort of shows shows up how big I actually am. Um, so talking about the guys in the band, there obviously you know um, it's been kind of fairly public that Martin's decided to step away after you know twenty five years of being a part of the band. Um, yeah. Do you want to give a quick um, quick shout out to the kind of who is the twenty twenty one lineup? Um, yes, yeah, as, as as you write. Quite, quite rightly point out, Martin left the band um, just recently at the three live stream shows we did in London. But we'd known he was leaving since sort of January 2019, I think it was when he originally told us. Um, but said he was going to, you know, see out all the shows that we'd had booked with him. Um, obviously, COVID then struck, and he kept doing as much as he could. But there, there, there came a point where we'd all sort of agreed that Harry was going to be the next bass player, and that was. Martin's choice as well. We've known Harry for a very, very long time. Um, and Martin said, well, it's not fair on Harry if I just keep doing stuff. So we'll see uh, when we get to reschedule those two live stream shows that we did. And and he said, they'll be my last. So they were kind of celebration of everything with Martin. And it was nice to draw a line under it finally. Um, obviously, he'll be missed. He's uh, an integral part of what we've done for the past 25 years and a founding member. But as I say, it's all amicable. And you know, you know we're, we're still in touch with mine on a daily basis. Love him to bits, and he loves us. And he said, you know, you have my blessing to go out and continue Orange Goblin because we'd kind of agreed years and years ago that if any of the four of us could decide to call it a day, that'd be the end of the band. But Martin said, I don't want that to happen. He said, I know how much you lot still love doing it. It's just my personal choice, so you carry on. So here we are in 2021 with myself on vocals, Chris on drums, Chris Turner on drums. Joe Horstead on guitar, and we now have Harry Armstrong playing bass. And as I say, Harry's been a long-term friend of ours from back when he used to play with, well, originally Decomposed and Hangnail, um, through Earls and Mars, Noise Picker, uh, End of Level Boss, he now fronts Blind River as well. Um, he, he was the guy that originally coined the phrase Orange Fucking Goblin Baby, uh, Circa Time Travelling Blues, and his name was on the original T-shirts as, a, as the, uh, the rightful owner of that quote. So he was the natural choice. He's a great bass player, he's a great uh, guitar player, great keyboard player, great singer. So he, he's got the lot and he brings he brings another sort of angle to Orange Goblin with not just our songwriting, but our on-stage presence as well. Yeah, as Martin said, at least you finally got someone who can do backing vocals properly for you. Martin, Martin was always the first to admit that he weren't, uh, singing weren't his strong suit. So, you know, it was like, you can utilise Harry's voice now with the backing vocals and uh, that's going to be to your advantage. So. Yeah, I mean, Martin did a fair job with the backing vocals. But as I say, he was never, never very confident with it. But Harry is, and that's gonna, that's gonna be useful for us when it comes to writing the next album. Moving on from that, it's been a, it's been a long old time since kind of uh, our haunted kingdom. And you, you know, you did that split with Electric Wizard, which I think was like nineteen ninety five, ninety six, somewhere back there. Yep. You know, so what do you think to the orange, uh, the orange goblin journey since then? It's been a, it's been a long old, uh, long old road. Right. It's it has been a very long road, and it's been you know over half my life has been dedicated to Orange Goblin. Um, but I wouldn't change a single thing. You know, we started the band as four bored teenagers sitting around at Martin's dad's house, uh, drinking during the day, wondering what we could do, sitting listening to a Bitchery and Carcass album, and uh, decided to form a band ourselves. Um, as you say, originally we was called Our Horn of the Kingdom, um, and it, it was so long ago. We're back in the days of like tape trading and handing out flyers at gigs and things like that there was no such thing as the internet back then so we worked our way up the up the ladder the hard way really and we we kind of fell into um a london scene that was that was growing all the time um after that initial period of being our haunted kingdom we 
sort of falling in love with Sabbath and Trouble and and, and yeah, because that was on that was on Dorian's label, Rise Above, wasn't Rise it? Above. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and at that period, in that period of time, it was obviously Lee Dorian's band Cathedral were kind of leading the charge in the UK. But we were big fans of like of Paradise Lost and Anathema and My Dying Bride, Solstice, and then you know we we started doing shows with the likes of Electric Wizard and Morn and Acrimony. Um, it was it was a great time. It was a great scene in the UK around that time. And we were lucky that one night we was playing a show in London with Electric Wizard and Lee Dorian came down, really liked what he saw um, and heard. And he offered us a record deal on the spot. And being big Cathedral fans, we jumped at the opportunity. Um, and yeah, then the first album came out, I think it was 97. As you say, we did a split seven inch with Electric Wizard around 96, I think. First album, 97, Time Traveling Blues, 98, Big Black, 2000, Coup de Grass, 2002. It was just like a slow s snowball effect, really. It was just, I mean, you know, when you start a band, you set your set your goals realistically and you say, like, right, well, we want to do a demo, we want to want to do some local shows supporting some bands that we like. And we did that. We, got, we were lucky in London at the time that there was always bands coming through and we got to play with the likes of Fu Manchu and Nebula and Queens of the Stone Age and all these sort of guys, spiritual beggars. Um, so that kind of put us on the map. And then, as I say, it snowballed up to the point where um, 98, uh, no, sorry, 99, we went on our first European tour with Cathedral and then we went over to Japan. And then 2002, we went over to the US and toured with Alabama Thunder Pussy and it just kept growing. So we've been really fortunate. We, we, uh, we don't take any of it for granted. At the same time, we know we've worked hard and we've stuck by our guns. We've never sold out or anything like that. But it, it's just always been fun. There's always been something new and exciting to look forward to. No matter you get to a point where you think, surely it can't get any better than this. Like playing in Poland with Heaven and Hell or playing the main stage at Ozfest. You're just like, surely it doesn't get any better than this. But it does. And there's, there's always <laughs> new things to, to keep you driven and, and yeah. make it fun. And we've always said, you know, the day it stops being fun is the day that we'll call it quits. But we're, we're still, you know, we was 23, 24 years old when we started the band. And I still have the same enthusiasm now as I did back then. And, and that kind of goes on to, you know, how you guys are on stage. It always looks like a party, you know, when you guys are uh, when you guys are paying. There's, you know, I guess you get kind of tagged with this kind of doom stoner um, yeah. kind of um, genre. But... It, it never looks like you're a load of miserable head, you know. No, I, I understand. Where, a different attitude. I understand where that tag comes from. Like I say, those early days we were playing with the likes of Fu Manchu and Queens of the Stone Age, and we were heavily influenced by Sabbath and Caius and, and Monster Magnet and all the bands that are associated with that stoner thing. But, you know, none of us smoked weed. We did back then in the early days. We liked to have a joint every now and then, but... For me personally, I don't think I've smoked a joint since about 1998 because I've always enjoyed a drink and every time I had a joint with it, I was, I was sick. <laughs> just, just didn't, didn't mix me. So we've always, we've always preferred other recreational uh, pastimes, shall we say. <laughs> things, things that keep us up and give us a bit of energy. <laughs> and, you know, the music reflects that. Right? You've got the likes of Electric Wizard that, they make music that is obviously influenced by smoking a lot of weed. And um, I, I've always sort of maintained that they're a bit more Sabbath. We're a bit more motorhead and we like that. And, and obviously we, we've struggled to shake off that stone of tag over the years. But I think the, especially the last four albums of our career have kind of showcased that there's more to us than just a stoner rock band with, we're, we're, we're just a, a good hard rocking heavy metal band. That's that's what it comes down to. Yeah. Same, you know, Lemmy never liked the tag for Motorhead, a heavy metal band. He's like, no, we play rock and roll. That's it. Just yeah. just loud and fast. Yeah, exactly. So you know, we're we're similar in that respect. So the scene itself was obviously you know back back then was pretty different, and um, you know the way you approached albums and stuff, I guess, was different. Have Have you changed the way you do things? You know, have you have you gone? You know, do you all sit at home and write stuff and kind of share it by WhatsApp and Dropbox and shit? Yeah, you, I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the only thing that's changed really. I mean, we've gone through periods of our career where we all shared a house in London. We called it Goblin Towers. It was in, actually in Greenford, and it was fucking bedlam in there. Absolute bedlam every night. There was parties. Uh, we had sort of 
of a fridge for food, which had like one mouldy cucumber in it, and a fridge for beer, which was constantly stocked. Uh, it was one of those days. It was like being in the young ones for a few years. And and obviously then we used to be able to write together and throw ideas around a lot. And then, you know, as we grew older and all got families and got married and things like that, things changed. And, you know, we'd, uh, we'd write, write ideas and come to rehearsals and put them all together and everything. Um, and now we're even further apart. Chris lives in Hove. Joe's in uh, North East London. Uh, yeah, North East London up by uh, Leighton Stoneway. Um, Harry lives down near Guildford and I'm obviously down here in Cornwall, so it's a bit more difficult. But as you say, technology has kind of eased that process now and being able to use stuff like GarageBand to record ideas and, and then send, send things via WhatsApp and stuff like that means that you know, we are constantly in touch and exchanging ideas all the time. So um, that's the only thing that's changed. We, we've never been one of those bands that kind of sit on the bus and write on the road sort of thing. No. We're too preoccupied with having a good time to, to worry about that. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's it's a last minute affair for us. We, if we know we've got to go into the studio and there's a deadline to, to send the album to the uh, record company, then we'll get it done. But it's a case of... Uh, everything last minute. I, I think you work better under pressure. I, I hear these stories of bands that go into the studio for like six months at a time. I'm like, what the fuck are you doing in there? Yeah. <laughs> it's like sitting around twiddling your thumbs. It's like, you go in, you record the bass, you record the drums, you record the guitar parts, and you throw the vocals on over the top, and it's just done. And I always feel that if I had more time, if we had more time in the studio, we'd end up tinkering with stuff too much, and you lose, around with stuff. Stuff. Yeah. you lose that spontaneity of what rock and roll should be about. Yeah, 100%. Um, you could talk about that, you know, obviously you, you've always had that groove and a bit of bluesy undertone that kind of comes, you say, comes from the Sabbath stuff and comes yeah. from that. Do you think as you've gone on, you've kind of got, in some ways you've got heavier, you know, you've not not in a kind of, uh, not in a doomy mm -hmm. way, but yeah. it, it's, you know, it, it was that a natural progression or is it kind of something you wanted to? Yeah, as, as I say, those, those first albums were more influenced by what well, was just us being like kids in a sweet shop and wanting to try everything out and putting keyboards on there to sound like Pink Floyd and putting riffs in that we wanted to sound like Sabbath. And you got Joe, the guitar player, who, who, who writes the sort of bulk of the riffs. Chris contributes quite a lot of them as well. And Martin also used to do his fair share. But Joe contributes the bulk of them. And Joe's background is very blues based. He grew up listening to like, you know, um, BB King and John Lee Hooker and Muddy Waters and um, all those sort of old bluesmen really. And mix him with Jeff Beck and Eric Clapton and Cream and Jimi Hendrix and, and the, the rock music of the seventies, like Purple and Sabbath and Zeppelin. That's, that's Joe's background and that's what he brings to the party. Then you've got Chris, who's an old sort of, uh, Hunt Saboteur, um, full left wing sort of um, crusty punk hardcore kid that grew up with Discharge and GBH and Peter and the Test Tube Babies and stuff like that. And he brings that punk element. And then you've got Martin and myself that are more straight ahead, Metallica, Iron Maiden, Judas Priest, Saxon, um, Death Metal even, um, and just down the line metal fans. Yeah, uh, and you, you put that all together, and and that's what creates Orange Goblin. And it took us a few albums to kind of, kind of realize that, because as I say, we were preoccupied with wanting to sound like something, and then realizing that we've got such a diverse range of influences among ourselves that you can just sound like them, you. Just let them flow, yeah, and it creates yeah. something actually quite. We always said we've ripped off so many other bands that we've created something quite unique. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, uh, hey, isn't that what all music is about? It's just ripping yeah. someone else off and playing it slightly Absolutely. different. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Tony Omi has basically written every great guitar riff anyway, so That's all it. you're doing is recycling his his work. Play it faster, play it slower, remix it. It's all good. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Um, funny enough, you, you mentioned about kind of death metal and stuff there. And every time, like it, w every time we see a picture of you, you know, you're in this, you know, you're not wearing a Sabbath t-shirt. You've got an Entombed t-shirt on, or you know, you're wearing a razor one today, or other girl. What? Where do your own tastes kind of, you know, kind of, um, kind of broaden out to? Are you are you still listening to all those different sorts of music? Are you still kind of? Yeah, I mean, a metal I love, head at heart. I love everything from you know the extreme black metal right through to classical music and a bit of everything in between. I grew up, my mum 
was always playing Motown and Stax records around the house. Grew up listening to a lot of that. My dad was always into the Kinks and the Beatles and the Stones. And then, you know, as you become a teenager, you sort of develop your own taste at school. I was really into stuff like the Smiths and Stone Roses as well. And then I discovered Metallica and Guns N' Roses' first album. And that kind of, that's a gateway into other stuff. And I kind of took a massive step from there, sort of hanging out with Martin and, and discovering stuff like Obituary, Cannibal Corpse, Napalm Death, Carcass, yeah. uh, Sacred Reich, Sepultura, all those sort of bands. And, and that opened the door for me to stuff like Dark Throne and Mayhem. And, you know, obviously that leads you on to going back and finding Venom and Bathory and yeah. Hellhammer and Kelly yeah. Frost. So <laughs> we, 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 you know, we, we were all of that, era, you know, of that era that kind of yeah. late 80s, very early 90s. There wasn't all this yeah. subdivision of, you know, you, you mentioned a lot of the bands. I was quite happy to go from a Metallica to a Paradise Lost to, you yeah. know, I put some got, you know, a bit of the cure on, followed by yeah. some anthrax. And so, and it, it, there was less this genre hitting. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I'm quite as happy sitting here listening to, I don't know, dissection and, and then I can put on Sisters of Mercy and, you know, that's that's what I love about music is it's subjective to whatever mood you're in. It shouldn't be dictated by having to fit into a certain genre or anything. Like the scene kids will tell you you're wrong. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so, no, I mean, I've got a lot of diverse stuff in my record collection. As I say, from I love early 70s Elton John. I love classical music. I love I love a bit of everything. If music's good, then I like it, whether it's whether it fits the what's supposed to be cool or not. I don't care. Yeah. Yeah, and that and that comes with growing up a bit as well, doesn't it? You know, not having to worry so much about fitting in anymore like you did when you were sixteen. Yeah. <laughs> um. So, kind of on that vein, are you? You know, who are you seeing in the kind of UK and international scene? Are there kind of some young bands that you kind of seeing popping up that that spark that interest still, or are you you do you sit like me in your comfort zone sometimes and think I could just listen to the stuff um, I've been listening to for twenty five years? Obviously, uh, working as a booking agent, you have to keep your finger on the pulse and see what's what's good. And that can be that, that, having that open mind and that um, that diverse sort of range of uh, of tastes is is useful in my job. Um, I've just we recently had a show down here on Saturday at the Yard, and uh, the opening band, Mother Vulture, really young band, but they blew me away. And it's you know not something that I normally kind of listen to. So it was it was it was refreshing to hear a young band doing something a little bit different, and I'm actually going to go and see them again tonight in Nuki. They impressed me so much, and I'm I'm you know they're one of the bands I'm headhunting and hopefully going to sign to my uh, roster. <laughs> but but at the same time, there's bands like Enforced that we just signed from the US. Yeah, so an album called Kill Grid on Century Media, and it's my favourite album this year. And it's just old school Sepultura riffs with Slayer and Integrity and proper crossover thrash in there. Yeah. So, I mean, there's there's all sorts of new bands. I'm into a lot of the sort of post-punk stuff that's coming out at the moment. Uh, just signed this band, a two-piece band called Zetra, which is bizarrely like a cross between Type of Negative and Gary Newman, which, you know, wow. doesn't sound like it should work, but it does. So... You know, like I say, I have to sort of remain open to, to a little bit of everything. So there's always new and exciting bands coming along. And, you know, weekends, Saturday and Sunday, that's when I delve into my record collection and dig out all the old classics. Through the week, I'm always, you know, listening to new releases and, and demos. We get sent a lot of stuff, obviously, via email yeah. to, the, to the agency. So I'm lucky that I, I kind of get switched on to a lot of this stuff by people. Um, Hutch, you helped me write me questions. Is one of my reviews. I think he reviewed you for uh, Razor's Edge the other day for um, yeah. for the Yard gig. So he was at the Yard last week, and he was saying that you know it, it was just a real boost coming out of COVID and all that. You know that I guess it's a hometown gig for you in some ways, but it was, um, it was yeah. a it was a real you know real nice nice way to kind of say we're back and you know yeah. we're going to come out the back of this and hopefully keep things going again. Well, firstly, it was very unique, and it's the only show I've ever done where I've been able to walk off stage and then walk straight into my front room. <laughs> <laughs> um, and secondly, yeah, I mean, I came down to Cornwall last September to see a socially distanced show that Jules was putting on here. Jules Chanellis is uh, my business partner at Route One Booking, and um, he manages the band King Creature. And he put on a socially distanced show for 250 people last year with all grid lines marked out on the floor so everybody could social distance and everything 
and it was a massive success and it was just a great vibe down here great feeling the staff here were fantastic and just a great atmosphere to enjoy live music because bear in mind this was in the middle of last summer when there was nothing all cancelled have been uh, all festivals have been postponed and uh, cancelled so um that was part of the reason I wanted to move down here because I'd seen what he was building here and I saw what was what the potential was. So this this show we did on Saturday, um, we didn't go full capacity. We're licensed to a thousand capacity here, but we wanted to get the infrastructure right first and foremost. So um, we did something like four hundred tickets this weekend, and it was it was just a fantastic day. Six bands, one day, um, no stress. We didn't see an ounce of trouble. There's really good facilities on site for food, drinks, there's bars. We've got everything here and and yeah, the weather held out for us. So it was a great day all round. And you touched on you touched on Route One, obviously you're kind of getting heavily involved in that. How did have you kind of have you gradually grown your involvement as you've kind of, you know, obviously you're booking at first and you... Route One booking was always like a joint venture between Jules and myself. Um I'm not sure how many people are aware, but I was a booking agent at United Talent Agency up until last September. Um, and I left there and that's when Jules and I started Route One Booking. Uh, involved me and my wife relocating to Cornwall in January, which I've no regrets about doing. And it's, it's just, people thought we was mad starting a booking agency during a pandemic, but we saw it as the perfect time to start to evaluate what's going to be possible when things do reopen and start getting a strategy and a structure in place. And so far, touch wood, that's, that's proven to be the case. We're in a really good position with it. We've got clients with shows booked up now into 2023 and, you know, we're keeping everybody on the road. We had King Creature and Blind River went out in May and did probably the first proper full socially distanced UK tour. I know a lot of, bands have done socially distant shows in like this town or that town yeah. but not actually done a week of consecutive shows so we were very proud to put that together and that gained a little bit of uh, interest in the press so yeah it's it's just an exciting period for us we focusing on you know just talent that we can be passionate about and not just not just like a regular booking agency that you know will book a show or a festival and take their cut we're trying to help build careers we're trying to help out with the logistics, give them an understanding of, of how the whole music industry works from offering advice on the managerial side of things through to helping them with their backline, their merchandise and, and every other facet of the industry at the moment. And that's, a, you know, obviously a changing situation with, you know, not only post COVID, but post Brexit, shit's changed. You know, it's not yeah. as easy as it once was. No, obviously, you know, there's been a, I think COVID meant that a whole lot of the Brexit stuff got swept under the carpet and, I yeah. mean, that, I think that was part of the government's plan originally. <laughs> so, um, so now, now we're coming out of COVID, we're starting to cross the Brexit bridge again. And, you know, there was some good news yesterday where we've got 19 countries have just announced that UK artists and crew won't need uh, work permits or and can travel visa free. And they're still talking to a load of other European countries about that as well. So hopefully that side of it isn't going to be so complex and we're going to be able to travel freely without the work permits. One thing that we're still unsure about is how, how the carnets are going to work and that sort of thing. But, you know, it'll come out in the wash. And I'm sure because because nobody's really toured extensively yet because the restrictions do vary so much from country to country. There hasn't yeah. been the opportunity to tour that much. So, But as, as things open up and we see it happening, everybody will sort of realise that it is still a possibility. It's going to involve a bit more paperwork and a little bit more planning. But, you know, those that want to do it will do it. <laughs> I've heard a lot of agents and a lot of managers say, well, this might be the kind of talent filter that we've been waiting for because you get a lot of shit bands that just want to draw and, uh, and, and have been free to do so. But now they've got to put a bit of work into it. It might sort of sort out the wheat from the chaff. Sort of yeah, I guess it stops uh, five, five lunatics jumping into a transit and decided they're going to do a European tour without any yeah, thought. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> without actually planning anything, just yeah. turning up outside a venue, can we... We throw our gear up and play one night. Yeah, I, I, but you know, is that not the? Th I don't know if that should be encouraged or frowned upon. I think that's uh, you know that that's um, how uh, millions of heavy metal memories yeah. have been made. Yeah, I think I think it's a case by case basis on that one. <laughs> yeah, some some people shouldn't be allowed instruments, let alone the van to take them anywhere. <laughs> um, so go, coming back to kind of Orange Goblin, um, you've. Um, you kind of um, you've got such a wide back catalogue now. You know, you kind of talked about a lot of the albums. 
uh, but you still manage to kind of take a little sprinkling from across the uh, across the uh, decades as you go. Does it get harder and harder to kind of come up with a set list, or are you kind of are there some go-to favourites? No, it does get harder because obviously uh, the people that you do it for are your, your fan base, and and everybody's got their favourites, and everybody wants to hear different songs every now and then. So, and that's fair enough. And we used to be quite stuck in our ways. We'd be like, nah, bollocks, that's what we want to play, so that's what we're doing. And then we went on tour in North America with Clutch in 2013 and did eight or nine weeks with them and noticed that they take it in turns to write the set list every night. So they will mix it up and play a completely different set one night from what they did previously. And we was like, that's inspirational. That's that's dedication to knowing your back catalogue. And, you know, when you've got nine studio albums, there's almost like 100 songs worth of material there. We're like, okay, then, you know, we should try doing that. And so we, it has opened us up to, to doing some of the older stuff more often. Um, obviously, that situation is a little bit more difficult at the moment with Harry being so new in the band. Um, he hasn't had a chance to sort of learn every song that we've done yet. But He's only doing bass. There's lots of open E's. That's all he needs. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, I'm hoping yeah, over time, I think he's got about 30 songs that, that we can mix up. So, you know, that's enough to keep us going for the, the shows we've got lined up and the tour in December. So, he's got there. to learn, he's got to come up with new stuff and go back and learn the old stuff all at the same time. And, and yeah, and he's still doing Blind River as well. So, <laughs> kind of on that, on that note, you know, um, the reason we managed to get this uh, interview is because um, obviously Matt from Cherry Red kind of puts in touch. You're about yeah. to do a reissue of, um, Healing through fire. He, yeah, so fucking hell, that went from that's me not concentrating on what's going on. Yeah, so you, you, you're putting out healing again, uh, originally out in 2007. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was, why, uh, why now? <laughs> one of those albums that's been out of print for a while, and it seems to be a fan favourite. Um, and Dan Tobin, um, who used to work at Earache and has been doing a bit of consultancy work for us, helping us out with a few things, he um, he's uh, suggested that we do it. Um, Said, but if we're going to do it, let's offer something different. So, you know, we wanted to put some added bonus tracks in there, redo the artwork, um, all write some liner notes, that sort of thing. And it's all been remixed and remastered, that sort of thing. You've got some um, sessions that we've done at the BBC Made of Our Studios. You've got some demos that we'd recorded in Boston, Massachusetts on our 2006 US tour with Scissor Fight. Um, there's a whole audio of a live show we'd recorded at the Astoria in 2006 with Grand Magus. Um, and it's all packaged really nicely and and uh, Orange Goblin fans seem to seem to like it. So yeah, uh, we, we announced it a little while back that we was doing this album and it was, it was met with a lot of enthusiasm. So I'm yeah. pleased to find it back out there. Now that di that disc too is the is you know is where the magic happens. All those little kind of insights into you know it's great to hear the new the, the original album and it's you know say so it's been remixed really nicely. But yeah. it's those kind of those slightly rarer things that really make it a special I package. Agree. I mean, as as a music fan, that's that's why you go and buy those special editions and the box sets of stuff because you get those rare bonus tracks that you may have never heard before. Yeah, and they're they're, they're the gold. So. So, yeah, it was nice to be able to put stuff in there. Orange Goblin's always been one of those bands in the past that we don't really have a lot of stuff lying around in the vaults. We kind of write enough to record an album, and that's what goes on there. Yeah. So, so it was nice to sort of uncover all this stuff and be able to remix it and put it in there. Was that is that sometimes a challenge, is kind of getting, getting your rights back to some of those things? Um, not so much for me. I mean, that's why we have people like Darren Tobin take care of that stuff for yeah, so, It's his fucking they, problem. <laughs> yeah, they take care of the rights and things like that. But, you know, I've, I've taken, I've, I've had to take more of an interest in that side of the business. And that's that goes back to when I started working at a, a music management company in 2007. Funnily enough, around the same time as Healing Through Fire, which was when we set up our own Orange Goblin music publishing company, um, and that's how I was aware that the you know the rights have reverted back to us for this album, so we're free to do what we like with it. And um, yeah, it's 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 kind of a necessary evil in the music industry because you can get screwed over and you can get taken for a ride if you don't know what you're doing. So it's good to have all your sort of uh, ducks in a row. Yeah, and you you kind of tend to hear a little bit less of it now, but you know there was lots of you know in the in you know from a thrash point of view in that kind of early late eighties yeah, kind yeah. of bands diving to be signed by every major in the world that you know could never really you know there's still bands that can't get their old stuff on spotify because they just don't own the rights anymore yeah, and, and 
you know, that you hear stories about people from what we'd consider legendary bands that made, made benchmark albums that say, yeah. I, don't earn, I don't earn a penny from that. We kind of rushed into signing a deal with some label or other and, and didn't read the small print that said that yeah. all the publishing belongs to them. <laughs> well, or didn't understand it because they were kind of 16, 17 and just so yeah. stoked to have, you know, label yeah. X talking to them. Exactly, yeah. I mean, I recall talking to Jeff from Possessed uh, about that similar thing. I and mean, obviously, Seven Churches, one of the most influential albums in extreme music. Yeah. And those guys were like 15, 16 years old at the time. They didn't really know what they was doing. But um, I think he got it all resolved in the end. So. <laughs> so kind of talking about, you know, releasing older stuff, what about what about new? Where's the uh, where's the kind of the vision for the next album? Well, it's in the pipeline. We are talking to other labels at the moment. Um, our deal with Spine Farm and Universal came up at the end of uh, the last album. Uh, what was it? Uh, Wolf Bites Back. Um, so we've been free agents for a couple of years and we didn't want to rush into anything. So we've taken our time um, assessing offers, having conversations. Because at our age, you know, it's it's not about having a massive sort of tour support and things like that. We're not going to be going out and spending six months on the road at our age. So we would, we just want to make sure the job gets done right with regards to marketing and promotion and, and, and distribution. Putting, yeah, putting it on the shelves in, around the world. So yeah. as long as those things are taken care of, you know, we'll, we'll still go out and promote it as much as we can. We'll still be doing festivals and small tours here and there. Um, so, yeah, there's expect some news on that soon. I can't give away too no, much, of course, cool. because we're still in the sort of nuts and bolts of the deal situation. But um, that'll be resolved soon. We'll announce that. And there's a plan to record in February and release the new material next summer. Oh, nice. Yeah. So, so um, you touched on it there about kind of getting things on the shelves. Obviously, you're kind of quintessentially... British in some ways, but yeah, you no. Know, where where are the places around the rest of the world? You know, where do you go? You, I think you mentioned Japan when we started talking. You know, are there, are there places you get in? You think flipping out? How, you know, how do we get like this here? This is a kind of yeah, absolutely. That's that's all part of that snowball effect. Is like how did these four idiots from Norfolk end up playing stages in Tokyo, Japan, and you know, we did things like Soundwave Festival in Australia, which is this huge touring festival that goes through the five major cities. We started in Brisbane, went to Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, and Perth. And the logistics involved in that are just insane. It's like Metallica were headlining it, and we were invited to the barbecue on the, the night prior to the festival kicking off that was all run by Metallica. And, you know, Lars and James were walking around talking to all the bands and got to shoot the shit with Lars Ulrich about Angel Witch and UFO, which was awesome, talking about new wave of British heavy metal. And, and you just think, how the hell did I get here? <laughs> so, you know, these are, these are people that I sort of dreamed about meeting when I was listening to them in my bedroom as a kid. So it's a, it's a strange journey. But yeah, we, we've been fortunate enough to, we played in Russia for the first time a couple of years ago. And as I say, we've been all over North America sort of a dozen times and Canada. And I mean, South America is about the only place we haven't really been now. So we're open to... Uh, yeah, and you hear some horror stories about uh, stories about tours in South America, don't you? There, there's yeah. some infamous tales. And then you know, I've, I've, I mean, Lee Dorian's told us a few horror stories about when Cathedral went down there. But at the same time, we talked to Shane Embury about touring down there, or, or uh, Nick Barker, and they'll tell you it's the best place in the world. So yeah, um, so kind of back into the UK. Um, obviously, Bloodstock is probably you know the biggest festival that's going to happen this uh, this summer. We're only a week away now, aren't we? Yeah. yeah. Um, it's become a pretty a pretty big UK fest, as in, you know, a lot of the, unfortunately, a lot of the bands from overseas have had to, uh, had to kind of drop out for all the various COVID reasons. Are you looking yeah. forward to kind of sharing that stage with, you know, the likes of Priest and Diamond Head and Saxon? And... It's, it's, the, it's the show that we've been kind of prepping ourselves for more than ever. It's, you know, it was supposed to have taken place last year and then was really disappointed when COVID struck and it got postponed. And we was delighted to be sort of rolled over to the lineup this year. And particularly that day, as you say, you've got Judas Priest, Saxon, Diamond Head, Therapy. It's like a celebration of, like a homecoming for British heavy metal, really. Yeah. It's the bands that we grew up worshipping. And to be able to tread the boards on the same day as those guys is going to be an honour for us. 
And do you manage to get, you know, festivals like that? Do you manage to get out and about? Are you going to sleek in, you know, slink into well, yeah. the new blood stage and check out my some wife, of the, the youth? My wife and I are driving up next Thursday. We've got a hotel just outside the festival that we're staying in. I'm going to be there for Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I've been a booking agent. I've got King Creature playing on the Sophie stage on the Friday. And I've got Borstal and Video Nasties and Dax and Roxanne playing on the Saturday. Then obviously Orange Goblin on the Sunday. So it's it's nice to be able to go up there. I can do the Orange Goblin thing Sunday, but Friday and Saturday I can do the networking as an agent as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, I didn't realise you had Borstal as well. That new, um, their new release, that's yeah. fucking brutal. That's... Yeah, I mean, I mentioned Nick Barker just now, but yeah, when, when I saw that he was doing this with uh, Pierre from uh, Knuckle Dust and and the guys from Drip Back, I, I knew it was going to be vicious and and proper old school hardcore. And it's got those thrash vibes, which all good hardcore should have. Yeah, exactly. Um, and this is going to be their first ever show on the main stage at uh, Bloodstock. So I'm looking forward to seeing that. And I'm tearing at a new one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what about Absolutely. what about Orange Goblin? Well, you got anything? You got anything planned? Have you uh, have you dipped into the back catalogue for some some treats, or is this kind of just? <laughs> Discussing it yesterday, and we I think we've agreed a set list now. It's I mean, we've got a 45 minute slot, so it's not a great deal you can do in that time, but we'll um, we're just going to go out and try to set the place alight. You know, when you get 45 minutes and you know you're going to be followed by the likes of therapy and uh, Saxon and Priest, you've got you've got to sort of leave your mark. So hopefully, we can do that, give, give the whole place a big wake up call and uh, give it our everything. Perfect. Um, finally, mate, do you want to pimp yourself out? Upcoming releases, uh, where we can kind of find you online for updates and all that stuff? Um, yeah, obviously, you've got the uh, Orange Goblin website, which is just www.orangegoblinofficial.com. Um, and uh, our Facebook page is the same, I think, forward slash Orange Goblin Official, as is the Instagram, all that. That, that gives you everything you need to know. But, um, yeah, just... Uh, I appreciate everybody still having an interest and, and still giving a shit about us after so many years. So uh, it's great that we, we're considered, you know, relevant enough that promoters and festivals still want to book us. Brilliant. Mate, have a great bloodstock. Um, and uh, I'm sure we'll see you at every size of gig from 300 people yeah. to 30,000 people in the coming year. And uh, and good good luck with everything with Route 1. Nice one. Cheers, Neil. Thanks, mate. All right, thanks. From their issue of Healing Through Fire, this is Orange Goblin and Vagrant Stomp.
Okay, next up, some Death Rash from Peru. This is Maze of Terror and their new single, Priest of the Ancient Ones. Yeah, 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 yeah
nasty little bastard that is. Okay, next up from the UK, this is our mates trapped in purgatory and spit it out. <laughs> about wraps things up for another episode thank you to Ben from Orange Goblin and Rue One Booking for joining us in the studio and thanks to Matt from Cherry Red for making that happen thank you as always to all the bands that let us use their music on the show thank you to you guys for keeping on listening and uh, hopefully enjoying what we get up to 
I'm going to play you out with another brand new track. This is from Danish Thrashers, Killing. This is taken from their brand new album, Out Today, Face the Madness. And this is Don't Get Mad, Get Evil. (laughs) 